an FRQ or a free response question is um, basically like a short prompt and a short response. I don't want to say it's an essay because I don't want you to think about it like an essay. Oh, so a free response question ends up counting for one third of your AP exam grade. And so you'd say, well, hmm, one third doesn't seem like, you know, obviously as much or a majority, but they're super important. They really um, are what can boost your score. You know, on the multiple choice section, a lot of times you can earn enough to get a three or a four, but that FRQ, that response writing is really what boosts you up into that five territory. And so I really want to stress that this year and really start working on it and start practicing it um, from the get go, just so that you feel comfortable with it. So the setup for the free response question on the AP test is you get 50 minutes and they give you two prompts and there's no penalty for like writing wrong information and so you should just kind of give it a go and try your best and it is um it is kind of a time crunch because there's usually about 16 vocab words that go along with the prompts so you have a lot of terms to work with within the prompts and then the scoring for the frqs is based on your ability to apply the terms to the situation so um, knowing the definition is not going to be sufficient to give you points on an FRQ, you really have to know the term and be able to give like a real world application or a prompt application to the question. And so there's a specific style of writing that goes along with this. And so chug sodas is the uh, kind of acronym or the mnemonic device that I use. And so you might wanna jot this down or take a picture, but the first things have to do specifically with just your overall approach. Be concise. This is not a big flowery essay. Extra information isn't going to score you points here. The, the people who read and grade these are looking for really specific points. And so adding in a lot of extra information isn't probably going to help you a whole lot here. Handwriting is going to be very important um, just because if they can't read it, they can't grade it. Uh, and you should use a pen because pen smudges less than pencil typically and is more permanent. You should always, always, always underline the word, whatever the vocab word is that you're using. You want to draw the person's attention to what you're talking about. So imagine this is how they grade them. Um, one of my one of the teachers I work with, she grades FRQs. They sit in a room all day grading hundreds of essays. And so you want to do everything in your power to make sure that they don't make a mistake because they're human. And so underlining the words that you're talking about draws their attention to it and makes sure that they don't miss that information. So you want to help them out to make sure you get the points you deserve. The G in chug stands for getting rid of extra stuff. You do not write an introduction. You do not write a conclusion. When my students write it, I don't even read it. I put a big X through it and ignore it. Um, it's just a waste of your time and you don't have a lot of it when you're writing this. So make sure that you are using the time to the best of your abilities. Um, I have a question about can we highlight? Um, I guess I'm not, I don't think they would penalize you for having a highlighter. Um, you can bring writing utensils in. So if you wanted to, I think that would be acceptable. I guess I've never heard of someone doing that, but I mean, underlining is typically the way that I would say to do that, but I don't think you're going to get penalized for doing that because, you know, people write in pen or pencil or whatever. So um, I would stick with the underlining, but if you feel comfortable doing that, I don't think it would be a penalty. On to the soda part then when you're answering the question, you want to leave space. So like I said, there's about 16 words or terms that you're going to be using in the prompt. And so you want to put a space between each one. That way, again, if I'm grading hundreds of essays in one day, I don't accidentally miss what one of your words. So I would always just leave one line of space between, you know, term one and term two. Leave a blank where you're talking about that. You should also always go in order when you're talking about these questions. Um, again, if I'm grading these essays and then you've got the first word last, the middle word first, and they're all like scrambled up into a big essay, I'm going to miss your information. So even if you're not sure about something, what I would do is go point one. Oh gosh, I don't even know what word one means at all. I would skip three or four lines and then start with point two. 
um, just leave yourself some space so you can go back to it. But I would never go out of order because that makes the reader's job a lot harder. So I would not do bullet points and I would just leave a space between each term. So let's say on the FRQ you have the term nature and the term nurture. You would start by talking about nature, write that paragraph all about nature, leave a space, and then write your next paragraph all about nurture. So the spacing is how you kind of denote that you're starting a new idea. And then specifically, this is all just kind of background stuff that we suggest you do, and we'll go over this again and again. But what you're actually writing then is you're defining and applying. So let's go back to that idea. If the term is nature, you would define nature. And I would literally start by saying nature is the idea in psychology that our genetics predetermine who we are. That's my definition. And that's really all you have to write for the defined part. And then I would immediately continue with this means that, and then you have to apply it to whatever the prompt is asking you about. So you always want to define and apply the term to the scenario. The application is really what scores you the points, but having a strong definition can um, support showing that I know what I'm talking about and give you a better chance of earning those points. And then the S, um, the last S in soda stands for synonyms. You don't want to use the word nature in your definition of nature. It, it doesn't show that you actually know what the word means. So try to find synonyms to kind of talk around those points, if that makes sense. All right, so I have a little practice prompt. It's pretty short and pretty vague because we are in, like I said, the intro unit. We haven't covered a lot of material yet. Um, but my practice prompt says, the Grinch who stole Christmas is all around Grinchy. His number one goal in life is to ruin the holiday season for all the who's in Whoville, and we really aren't sure why. Act as a psychologist from each perspective below and offer a possible explanation for why the Grinch acts the way he does. And so in the intro unit you've read, um, if you haven't started it yet, hopefully, I think most of you said you had, you've read about these three perspectives. And that's now what I need to respond to in the prompt. So following my chug sodas technique, I would start by talking about the psychodynamic perspective. And the psychodynamic perspective um, definition is as follows. The psychodynamic perspective believes that unconscious conflicts from our past are driving current motivation and behavior. So there I was very concise. I underlined the word psychodynamic perspective. So I look at that. I know right away what I'm talking about. I didn't write any sort of flowery introduction. I got right into the point. I defined it. And now I need to apply the term. So this is usually where it can be tricky. Sometimes you have to make up or add information in. So I have to guess now or apply why the Grinch is so Grinchy based on the psychodynamic perspective. And so my explanation says that perhaps when the Grinch was a toddler, the Grinch's father walked out on the family on Christmas Eve. While, that, while he does not specifically remember that event, those negative feelings are driving his current attitude toward the Who's and their Christmas celebration. So I'm showing that there's some sort of unconscious memory that's driving his negative behavior. I'm applying that idea of the psychodynamic perspective to the situation that's written about. And that's the key there. If you're bringing in new information, which is okay, you still have to make sure it links to the prompt. So I have to make sure I'm explaining why this information proves that the Grinch is Grinchy. Otherwise, um, you won't score the points if you don't relate it back to the prompt. The next term then in my prompt was the behavioral perspective. And so we did talk a little bit about the behavioral perspective. It had to do with like observable behavior, watching and learning from others. So again, I start with the behavioral perspective believes that human action is derived from learned responses and consequences. I got straight to the point. I underlined my term. I defined it. I didn't do any extra information. I was nice and concise. And then now the application. Perhaps as a child, every time the Grinch asked for a Christmas present, his mother put soap in his mouth. He has learned to associate the holiday season with the nasty taste of soap. Therefore, he dislikes everything to do with Christmas. So it was an observable behavior, the soap in the mouth, that made him now 
have negative feelings towards Christmas, things like that. Is this, um, hopefully this is making sense. Like I said, it's kind of hard to do an FRQ um, super in depth on the first day because we haven't covered a ton of terms, but we'll keep practicing it. And right now I think the big takeaway we need is the chug sodas idea. So the third bullet point here was the social cognitive perspective. And so again, I start by defining it right away. The social cognitive perspective of psychology states that a person's actions are influenced by their peers, environment, community, and more. Again, definition, concise, I've underlined, no extra info. I'm gonna keep drilling that into you guys this year because that's really important. Perhaps the Grinch grew up in a strict religious sect that does not approve of Christmas. The Grinch was influenced by his religious elders to despise and even try to ruin all things related to the holiday. So that would be then explaining why the social cognitive perspective says that the Grinch doesn't like Christmas and the Who's in Whoville.